Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for being here again. Uh, today we have a very special guest. Uh, he's Devashis Banerji. I'm not sure if I pronounced well the name. Yes, very nice. <laughs> so he's a professor in a university in the United States. He can speak about a little bit just to introduce himself. Uh, he have a PhD and he have books about our history and a lot of knowledge about the spirituality. So we have many questions for him. <laughs> so uh, I hope uh, we can cover some of them. If not, we are going to do others interviews. And also uh, if you have questions for him, you always can reach us in in the channel, you know, and comment and tell us what is your question. Uh, so do you want to begin to introduce yourself or is fine? Like, Yeah, thank you, Claudia. <laughs> so uh, uh, just very briefly, my name is Devashish Banerjee, as Claudia has already uh, mentioned, and I teach at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. And I am the chair of East-West Psychology and also of a new concentration called Asian Contemplative and Transcultural Studies. So my training, I am an art historian, but I'm also uh, trained in Indian philosophy, culture, and in postmodern uh, studies. So I think that's about enough for, for now. And we can launch into the interview okay great thank you Tavashis. so well i have this first question that we both know that is so big you know uh that uh, is uh what is your experience with our history you know like um, i mean why do you study that and i mean how do you let's say more like with your soul and heart you know like Yes, let's speak. Yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, studied art history. Uh, actually, my uh, dissertation is on modern art history, which is really the nationalist period that brings us into the 20th century in India. But also along with it, I studied the earlier art history, the whole of Indian tradition of art, uh, partly because that informs uh, our modern understanding of art to understand how we reinvent tradition, right? How we, to become modern to some extent, we lose our past and then we have to recover our past. And so art history helps us to recover our past from that point of view. But I also wanted to say that uh, in the academic study of art history as I underwent it, particularly people who study the tradition of Indian art um, and perhaps other places as well, uh, art history as an academic discipline um, as it has developed is actually more allied with the large field of collections, museology, uh, speculation, uh, auctions, and all that, because it's about valuing art. You see, most of it is about we look at different periods, we look at different objects, we treat them as objects, and we evaluate them for properties, sometimes formal properties, sometimes cultural properties, but we are always evaluating them. And this evaluating of art is a remnant from our colonial past. It's a kind of Orientalism and a colonial attitude by the same way in which colonization took place and people went to different parts of the world and collected art and sold and bought and became rich and things like that. So art history as a discipline is still connected with that to a large extent. Um, it, I don't think that that's how it should be. Uh, and my understanding of uh, the discipline of art history is different, uh, which is more um, 
decolonizing this notion of art history and to think about uh, art history more in terms of how it is used or how it can be used. Who are the makers? How, why did they make it? What was its use value, right? And how can we respond to it today in terms of the experiences that it makes possible? Um, so, and these experiences also are changing over time. So these kinds of questions are more interesting to me uh, for art history than uh, what is usually taught as art history. I hope that makes sense. Yes, of course, a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I love your answer because you say to take out this um, etiquette, like um, a stamp of uh, colonialism, you know, and just trying to trans like to go over that yes i i like it yeah it's very interesting i never have this point of view and it's uh yeah it's different okay so let's uh go with the other question that is more related with you speaking about indian art and <clears throat> can you tell when begin the representation of the gods, if it's very large, uh, just briefly? Yeah, so uh, the, the earliest Indian texts are called the Veda, and that's where we first encountered the gods. But these are the Vedic gods, and they're gods like Agni, the god of fire, Surya, god of the sun, Indra, god of lightning. So they're related to cosmic forces, cosmic mm -hmm. nature forces, but they are not represented. See, exactly. so what we what we uh, today believe is that they are represented through ritual. They are not represented visually. Okay. There are specific rituals. There are specific. Uh, designs, specific sequences, so that their representation is more like their manifestation. If you do a certain uh, sequence of invocation to a certain god, then the idea is that the god will manifest throughout that area in which that particular uh, you know, invocation is made. So that kind of uh, representation, which is more like a non-representation, is what we see in the early period. But today, what we see in temples, the idea of the gods, that begins that uh, those kinds of gods uh, start making their appearance only from around the turn of the millennium, you know, from around first century BC or so. And there too, the visual representation only begins from around the second century or so. You see, earliest, you see small images of some of these gods. Second century, you may see a uh, little more. But it's only from the fourth century, the transition from fourth to fifth century CE, that we start seeing large scale manifestations of these representations of the gods. And also we see uh, contextual representation of the gods, like sites in which many of the gods are represented in little temples. So that only happens from around, uh, I'd say, fourth, fifth centuries. Um, and it is related uh, to the kinds of patronage and the kind of prominence of certain sects um, and the what is called the Hindu synthesis that takes place, whereby all these various small sects are integrated into a large understanding, which is metaphysical and spiritual. Wow, okay. So basically, the images are like mostly... I mean, the, the gods was like mostly represented through rituals, like you say. And that rituals can be like the raga, like the music of the raga. So the is. music, uh, we are not sure when the music comes, but the representation in terms of uh, 
the non uh, visual is more through chants through uh, you know rituals like uh, spells or chants and sequences some objects that are sacrificed so there are fire sacrifices even animal sacrifices uh, they are done in certain sequences with certain mantras you know which is like uh, uh, like spells you know that sort of uh, uh, poetic uh, you know enunciations of words that are invocatory to these gods and so they come this is the earlier kind of uh, gods that are not represented in form uh, later what you see is these representations and forms but uh, what you as an art historian will know the idea of an iconic and iconic right so these are the iconic images but uh, an iconic uh, manifestations continue uh, so the god or goddess is supposed to exist in word form in also in a uh, diagram form what is called yantra uh, or in natural form so often in a temple you'll find many images but in the main shrine of the temple you may just find a rock uh you know so or you may find a design so uh these are the an iconic form forms of representation but along with it there are also iconic forms that but these iconic forms come only after about uh between 2nd to 5th 6th century ce and now we see a lot of iconic forms but that's of the history by how that happens wow that is uh, really interesting <laughs> because yes we we can divide different things and i maybe it's a topic that go more 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 deep yes and people yeah. can explore there in uh if people want to study about this how do you will tell them i mean how how they can study more deep about it i mean they have to go to india and ask questions to people and to gurus like this they can find out i mean the origin or no, is that possible that way they can't find out much because if you go to india and ask the people they don't know how those <laughs> images appear they just accept it this is the problem of history right oh, if, yes. if if you ask a common person either they have mythologies or they just think that it has always been there okay so you have to study art history you have to study the people who made a painstaking research on the archaeology on the texts on the history to find out how it happened so uh, unfortunately it is not through the gurus and through the people that you get these answers okay. it is through the academics that you get these answers but you know now is this time that we we arriving in the in this like saying that the academics are liars you know because i mean they are following the beliefs of the certain religious people and they are just covering the real truth so what do you think about it i mean yeah that, that is also true but it is partially true i think both of these things i mean uh you know interested academics in other words academics that has got self interest if i'm interested in something i can be biased and i can create falsehood into truth you know so like mm -hmm. you're saying right now we are living in a post fact era yes. you know <laughs> people are saying whatever they want <laughs> because they're interested in saying it and if you say it enough times if you put it in writing if somebody publishes it many people read it they think that's the truth yes but mm -hmm. th that's not the method of science the method mm -hmm. of science is verification so if there are no verification methods then yes you're right but i think the entire academic enterprise is based on discussion debate verification mm -hmm. any view that i i i can say whatever i want but somebody will contest it that's the whole thing about academics every idea has a opposite view and that is allowed it's only mm -hmm. by that that you can purify the knowledge and come to something which is plausible and still it is not certain 
you know, I'm not saying all this that I'm saying is certain. There is always a grain of uncertainty, uh, exactly. which is bigger or smaller. But still, it is more factual because these questions are factual. We, I can answer your question in another way. I can answer it in terms of mythology and legend. But that is also its own kind of, my, you know, sort of quasi reality. It's not a reality. It's a it's a symbolic reality. Okay, so, I mean, yes, because the, mm, I mean, the study of our history can be, I mean, we can approach our history through all these uh, science, or we can approach our history through a spiritual point of view, yes? Um, so, uh, approaching it through a spiritual point of view is uh, one aspect of it and normally most art historians don't approach it through a spiritual point of view but you can and if you can if uh, you know I mean most people who approach it through a spiritual point of view don't approach it for its history right they just approach mm -hmm. it for for a kind of sector uh, let me give you an example like what you said yes about uh, if you go to India uh, if you go to uh, a certain temple uh, and you talk to the priests of the temple, they will tell you what is the origin of that image. They will tell you what is the meaning of that image. They will tell you what is the expected experience of that image. And those belong to the experience world, right? Like you were saying, the experience world. Uh, but also that's the inner, you know, as an art historian, you know, about in culture studies, the idea of emic and etic, right? Emic means the insider view, right? So the insider view is about the what will facilitate a certain form of experience. You see, both a cultural experience and a spiritual experience, what will facilitate it? And the etic view is the view from the outside. That is somebody who does not necessarily believe in the belief systems from inside, who does not necessarily want to experience it, but is looking at everything from a point of view of a outside spectator who is trying to arrange things according to chronology, according to human history, right? Or human culture or whatever. So that kind of looking from the outside and looking from the inside, I believe in doing both. You have to do both. Because if you just look at it from the inside, it's okay for you, but it's not okay for somebody else, right? I mean, according to my belief system, I may believe that a God is uh, the supreme being, right? And if you bring some other God, I will say, no, no, my God is the supreme being, right? Then, Because that's also one of your questions. How do we live together? We can't live together like this. We can't live together by internal knowledge only. We have to respect other knowledges. We have to respect the fact that I have a right to say, my God, Shiva is the greatest God. But you have a right to say that your God, Jesus Christ, is the greatest God. Both of them are equally true. Yes. So we have to look at it from outside and inside both. Yes, I'm not trying to manipulate and say, uh, my God was the first one and we find the most antique archaeological place here. So this is the first and unique uh, no, art um, God that we can say sacred and forever, yes. I mean, yeah, you can say that, but you see, that's a, it's all, it's all there. You are right. I mean, we have to, we have to toe a very fine line because uh, sometimes our biases are working to create systems of competition, right? Which is the first, which is the second, and all that. Uh -huh. But yeah, that that kind of system of competition is based on bias, uh, and we are trying to manipulate knowledge to make it look like something. But if we are just trying to create impersonal history, uh, there may be uncertainty about it, but we, and also that, that there are different different histories, you know, there are different ideas about these things. 
but we gradually come to some sort of common understanding like what i'm talking about with regard to what happened uh with the uh, gods uh from let's say uh the you know 1500 bc to about say 900 bc or something like that and then what happened to the gods from the second century bc to the sixth century ce that has been more or less established by people who have agreed that this is what's going on okay so then the names of the gods are established and this is my i mean it's like my next question is like how many gods would you find there and how do you find them?